Hi guys, I was hoping to finish Righteousness Session 18, and I think I'm going to be able to do to do that right now. Um, and then hopefully tomorrow we'll actually wrap up these sessions on righteousness and get back to the Bible. Um, some righteousness realities, for one thing, number one, we do not grow in righteousness. We are made righteous. And righteousness is credited to us. So God himself is our righteousness and he made Jesus to be righteousness unto us. So there's no such thing as growth in righteousness. We're already made to be righteousness, his righteousness. So there's growth in the knowledge of what righteousness means to us. There's growth in acting as though we are righteous. So there, there'd be growth in our maturity in righteousness. There's growth in faith in our righteousness. But very few people have any faith in their righteousness in Christ. And that's sad. They have faith in their weakness. Listen to me now. Many people have faith in their weaknesses. Many people have doubt and fear and unbelief that they're fighting many times and they're they're so many have faith in their weakness and they have faith in their lack of ability but few have any faith in the thing that god has made them to be which is righteous <clears throat> so this is an unhappy fact until we until we have confidence in our own standing, our own right standing before the Father, in our own righteousness in Christ, we will never have faith that will bring blessing to ourselves and others. Amen? We've got to know the truth. The truth is what sets us free. Faith is destroyed by sin consciousness. Faith is built up and made Invincible by righteousness consciousness. So we've got to be conscious of our righteousness that we have in Christ. We have it. He bought it. He paid for it. So this entire problem, it rests upon our estimation of the word of God. If we have a low estimation of the word, then we will have a low estimation of our righteousness in Christ. If we have a low estimation of the word, our faith will be weak. Our faith will be weak. But if we believe the word, if we rest on the word and know that the word um, from God is, un is and know that the word of, from God is true and God, that God, the Bible says God cannot lie, then our faith becomes strong we've got to believe that we've got to read that we've got to know what the bible says and then when we say that god cannot lie we mean that the word of god the word the bible cannot lie it is the word with which we are dealing so the word is the contract it's the covenant it's the legal instrument with which we have to do it's more than a legal document it's a living document so it becomes a living force in our lives as we act upon it. A low estimation of the New Covenant or the New Testament will bring a low estimation of the work that Christ did. A low estimation of the Word and of the work that Christ did is going to react in our lives. It's bound to react in our lives. Men and women will see at once that there is something weak about you. There is something inefficient about you. Or, or they will see that in our lives. Men and women, as we go out, as we att attempt to evangelize or minister, they will see that there is something inefficient in us, in our lives. A weakness, an inefficiency. When we believe Romans 4.25, it will be manifested in our lives. It will be manifested in our conduct, our actions, our words, our deeds. The Bible says, He was delivered up on the account of our trespasses and was raised...
because we were declared righteous. People will feel it in our conversation. They will feel. What are they going to feel? They're going to feel that living word. That word is real. It's real to us. It's coming through us in reality because we truly believe the word of God. But if we doubt his finished work, every phase of our life is going to show it. The reason people can't get their healing is because of low uh, estimation of the word and of the finished work of Christ. When we have the proper estimation of the finished work of Jesus, then we know that, quote, by his stripes we are healed. And we don't need anyone to pray for us. We, we know we are healed. And with joy we thank him for it. All this trying to be worthy all this trying to be righteous, crying and agonizing before the Lord is a product of low estimation of the integrity of the word of God. And a lot of times we go through that. I went through a lot of that when I was younger, actually. Crying and agonizing before the Lord, not really understanding my place, not really understanding my righteousness in him not really understanding that I was in right standing with him and having that confidence within. So when we know that the word is true and that we are what the word says we are and we are who the word says we are and that we can do all that the word says we can do, then we begin to at once to take our place to assert our authority and to actually enjoy the privileges in Christ. We grow in grace. We grow in knowledge. We grow in authority. We grow in those places. Grace is love unveiled, love in action. It's love doing things. We can grow in that. We're always doing things. Hopefully, Lord willing, we're doing them as unto the Lord. We can let love dominate us in every area of our life. Then we will reveal Jesus in our conduct all the time. We can grow in love until our whole life is saturated with it. Until every motive will be born of it. Until every word will have its fragrance. We are righteous from the time we are born again. Faith grows as we walk in the word. We grow in knowledge of our righteousness. And what, what it can mean to us and its privileges and responsibilities, we, we've got to grow in that type of knowledge of our righteousness. We don't need to grow in sonship, though we may grow in the knowledge of what sonship means. So maybe the clearest definition of what we are in Christ is given in Hebrews 10, 38, where it says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrink back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So God calls the church his righteous one. He speaks of us individually as his righteous one. If we draw back into the realm of senses, of dead works, then we rob him of the joy but that belongs to him. Wow, you just think of the righteousness we walk in and who we are in him. The joy will flood your soul when you get that revelation if you don't already have it. Man's real need is met. Jesus in his... His great high priest prayer in John 17, 3 said this, and this is life eternal, <clears throat> excuse me, that they should know the only true God and him whom thou didst send, even Jesus Christ. So the word true means real, that they should know thee, the only real God. So we, we may have many theories, we might, might have many facts which men have gathered concerning God, but we will never know him, we will never know him as a father until we receive eternal life. 
We will never know the real Christ until we receive eternal life. We may know about him. We may have read volumes about him. But until we receive eternal life, we will never know him in reality. And when I say eternal life, I'm talking about being born again, receiving him as Lord and Savior of our our life. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the life. The life is the oil which, when ignited by love, gives out light. So this love that God and, and this love that Christ are both living realities. He said, I am the way and the reality and the life. So real philosophy is a search after God. The moment the philosopher finds eternal life, he stops being a philosopher. Become, he becomes a realist. God is love. Eternal life is the love nature of God. When we receive eternal life, we receive his love nature. Then that love nature begins to dominate us and gain the ascendancy in our lives. 1 John 4.16 tells us about abiding in love, making our home in love. It says, and we know and have believed the love which God hath in our case. God is love. And he that abideth in love abideth in God, and God abideth in him. So it is a love life. And we're beginning to walk in him and uh, walk with him. It makes a, a companion of him. If a man love me, the Bible says, he, Jesus, if a, if a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John fourteen twenty three. Can we ask anything more beautiful than that? I don't think so. Jesus and the Father will come and make their home with us no matter how humble it is no matter where we live if we could be homeless and they will come and make their home with us they will make it beautiful they will make it a safe place for children to be born no quarreling no bitterness no divorces can ever come into the home where jesus lives the home life with jesus is the mother of faith it takes our home Excuse me, it makes our home relationship beautiful. We meet dishonesty and faithlessness without saying an unkind word. Why? Because our whole life has changed because we have become a new creation. And the old man is dead and in the grave. That old carnal nature is gone. Does it try to raise its ugly head every once in a while? Yes, it does. But that's okay. We just nail whatever to the cross because that's where it goes. Everything behind us is dead. So we enter into a new kind of life where we never think of being neglected forgotten or ignored amen god's not going to forget us he's not going to ignore us he's not going to neglect us we never remember anything that is unkind so this new love is life this new life is love we for we forgive those who are dishonest because this new life has taken possession of us it's it's this new creation does not have hatred in it and bitterness in it and jealousy in it and all the ways and works of the flesh in it anymore. It's like Paul said, I die daily that Christ may live. And that's the new life. That's the life that's living in us. So in closing, we're loving as Jesus would love. We're giving as Jesus would give. We are as helpful as the master would be in our place. 
we live with him, his love is our love. His love flows through us. His strength is our strength. His ability is ours. We are his own love slaves, you might say. We love him. Why? Because he loves us. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. And I, I can't remember where that scripture is either, but that is the bottom line. You know, he has done everything for us. And the Bible didn't, you know, it wasn't, it, the Bible doesn't speak to sinners. So when you're out in the world, you're living in sin, that Bible is not speaking to you. You are not reading it or believing it or anything else. It's nothing to you. That Bible is the Christian's handbook for life that gives instruction on God's ways, God's thoughts, the, the character the Lord wants us to have, and the directions that God has given us for life. So we're not even going to read that Bible until we become born again. And we love the Lord, and we want to please the Lord. And you know what? There, There is a lot of different things we go through in that growth process. We start as a little tiny, tiny newborn baby. We know nothing at all. And from there, we're growing. So we make mistakes. We sin. Nobody is perfect, but we stay in an attitude of repentance, an attitude of love, an attitude of forgiveness, an attitude of all that is good because God is good. And we want to be like our Father. We want to be, we represent Him. And we want to be like Him. We want His character. And we're, so from the time of a newborn birth, we're going to grow from that time on the rest of our life into the fullness of, of His character. And it is a lifelong process. It does not happen overnight. You're going to stumble. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to have discouragements. You're going to have an enemy. There is real warfare. There is a real devil. Whether you believe it or not is not going to change it. A lot of Christians today don't believe the devil's real. They don't believe warfare is real. That They don't believe hell is real even. But I got news for you. The Bible says it is, so it is. And, um, you know, that's what, that's what God has left for us, and it's, it's managed to live through the ages. The Bible has never been done away with. It's the greatest book ever survived through the whole world and, and still a living word and still available to us today. So we need to take that word and cherish it, live by it, learn from it, realize that we are, as we've been talking about recently, the righteousness of Christ. Do we deserve it? No. Do we feel righteous? No. But are we righteous? We stand in his righteousness. We are righteous. We stand before the Father in right standing. And in saying that, I am going to close and just say, you know what? God bless you, each and every one. I declare that uh, over you that God's will be done, that everything that God wrote in that book that he began to take notes and write about you from the day that you were conceived in your mother's womb, that that is what will come about that his will will be done in your life and you will fulfill your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.